Hello, I am Inge Lördendin. I'm from Bohuslands Museum, as Brian said, in Uddevalla in Sweden. And I'm here with my two colleagues, Linnea Nordell, also from Bohuslands Museum in Uddevalla, and Lars Tvid from Vitleke Museum. And we are working as archaeologists, spending our everyday job with issues concerning the cultural heritage within the county of Bohuslän. Our aim with this presentation is to show what historic graffiti in a maritime context looks like how we interpret some of the carvings, and finally, we will give a brief insight into the process of documenting them through archaeological methods and digital photo techniques. The maritime graffiti we find at the natural har harbors outside Boesland dates from early modern times. During most of this time, Boesland didn't belong to Sweden, but was a part of the kingdom of Denmark, Norway. It had several important natural resources like wood, grain, and fish that were of interest for Denmark in building and maintaining a strong and powerful nation. The coast of Bohuslän also had the advantage of being facing to the important Skagerrak area, which in those days in practice was a Danish-Norwegian inland sea. Here intense shipping activities took place both in times of peace and war. Many fishermen, international traders, noble travelers, and seafarers were fishing, exchanging, and transporting goods and people in between the Scandinavian countries, the Baltic Sea, and the cities of the North Sea coasts. The sailing route along Bohuslän and Norway were already in the medieval times, a vital communication trail regularly used by the merchant ships of the Hanseatic fleet. On this Dutch chart from the mid 16th century, named Karte van Osland, we see the coastline of Bohuslän and Southern Norway with several natural harbors highlighted. These places were all very important for the foreign seafarers to keep track of during their exposed and dangerous everyday business. They provided safe havens when tough weather conditions arose or were just calm places to stay overnight while waiting for the daylight or for the right wind to blow. It was well known that passing the north tip of Skagen was a huge challenge because the waters outside were known to be treasonous. Of the 12 natural harbors <clears throat> with the maritime great city, we know of in Bohuslän, we have been able to survey and document four of them more thoroughly. Starting in 2010 with Väderöarna, then Södra Bursa with Holle in 2012, and from 2014, we have been engaged in a place called Hamneholmarna. This old harbor called Viholm on this map is nowadays known as Hamneholmarna and it were historically probably one of the most frequently and used harbors in Bohuslän. And it's still one of the most popular seaports along the Swedish west coast during summertime. As an example of a natural harbor, we see Hamnholmarna from the air on a nice and sunny day in May. And as you see, many of these natural harbors consist mostly of bare cliffs without any major vegetation at all, and without any permanent buildings to stay in at the visit. The environment can sometimes be rather harsh. The cliffs are not always giving enough shelter when heavy rain and storm comes in. Therefore, many activities for the sailors would have taken place aboard or in the near of the ship, like cooking, making minor repair works, smoking clay pipes, and so on. And here we see the harbor where the ships really lay uh, at the cliffs. And today we see the traces of the activities through the fragmented garbage residues still lying on the sea bottom, such as shirts of cooking ware, drinking vessels, clay pipes, animal bones, and some bits of leather shoes. Everything broken was then just thrown in the sea. But strangely, today we are thankful for that because we can now learn more and about Siemens everyday life. These objects on display here are some of hundreds of artifacts that were salvaged during divings in the 1980s and are now a part of Bohuslän Museum's collection.
At some, some of the nature harbors, there are also a simple stone walled enclosure. Today, anonymous and abandoned, but according to contemporary sources, they were once used as burial grounds for fishermen and seafarers. Remains of human bones have occasionally been found in some of them, confirming that they were used for burials. Now, after spending many years of surveying, detecting, and looking at the cliffs in different lights and angles, we see typical areas where we find the rock carvings at natural harbors. Situated on the both sides of the harbor basin, clearly facing the arriving boats, and on the highest parts of the islands with a good view of the surrounding sea. The harbors can contain anything from a handful of carvings up to more than a thousand of different signs and symbols, as on Hamnholmanna. Right. Let us now take uh, a closer look at the different categories of carvings or graffiti that we find in this uh, maritime context. Uh, the bedrock of Bovuslen is mostly made of granite, which is hard and tough to work with. Uh, and the marks, they are often deep and roughly made. Uh, and they were made with hammer and chisel, and they generally date from the 1500s and the 1600s. Uh, one of the most common categories we see here uh, are house marks or merchant's marks. During the 15th to 17th centuries, uh, in Northern Europe, these marks were used not only by merchants, but by all social classes as a sign of identity, ownership, or manufacturer. Um, in a maritime context, they would have been used by merchants, seamen, and craftspeople. And in this example, um, we see simple forms of, mer of merchants' marks that generally lack any additions of initials or dates or other embellishments. We believe these two date from the late 1400s and early 1500s, and that is, they are slightly older than most graffiti found in this, these harbors. Uh, we often see merchant's marks in combination with initials, dates, names, and shields, as seen here on the left. During the course of the 17th century, uh, initials grow more and more common, and merchant's marks grow more rare. Uh, to the right here, we see initials of four persons with the date 1689. And the text tells us that all four of them were from the Danish town of Horsens. Most place names that we find uh, in the graffiti are towns in Denmark, but we also have some examples from Germany and the Low Countries. Many initials and merchants marks are, posi are positioned together in groups of three to five. And this is consistent with the size of a crew of the small trade vessels that sailed between Denmark and Norway at the time. Uh, identifying the persons behind the carvings has proven rather difficult. And to date, we have only identified a handful of people. And our chances increase when there is a full name, a place, and a date, as in this example. And Matthias Feldum, as we see here, he was indeed a merchant living in the Danish town of Aarhus, where he took residency in 1664 and lived until his death in 1709. Uh, and his trade journeys uh, apparently took him to Bovisland and the harbor of Hamnholmana at least once. Uh, heraldic coats of arms uh, can also help us identifying individuals. And these coats of arms, they are approximately 500 years old and belong to Scandinavian nobility. They are the oldest known graffiti uh, along the Bohuslän coast, and they only appear on Hamnholmarna. The nobility traveled a lot by boat and may have been the first to put their marks on the cliffs of the harbor. The lack of color on the coats of arms make it difficult to find which families they belong to, but one man decided to write his name alongside his coat of arms, and that made things easier for us. Uh, you can see there on um, the top left corner of the panel, uh, unfortunately upside down in this picture, but it reads Henrik Krummedike. And this was an extremely rich and powerful Danish nobleman 
uh, who lived between 1463 and 1530. Uh, and it turned out that the other coats of arms uh, belongs to noble families that were connected to Henrik in different ways. Family connections and alliances were important for the Scandinavian nobility, and it made sense to set these alliances in stone at the largest transit harbor along the coast. Uh, now we look at some compass roses, and they are, they are uh, generally carved at high vantage points close to the harbors. The compasses, they can be beautifully decorated, as seen here on the left, for example, with a fleur de deli north arrow, uh, or they could be made up in a more simple style. They are often surrounded by initials, merchants' marks, and dates. Uh, contrary to what one might expect, ship graffiti is extremely rare, and you are looking at the only example, one. It is a 17th century ship with three masts of a type that was in use along the trade routes in Northern Europe. Uh, this unique carving uh, was a mystery to us, but thanks to the graffiti research carried out here in Britain, uh, we have managed to identify it as a Solomon's knot, was, were we right in that? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and an apotropaic symbol that were meant to ward off evil. Uh, these symbols, they are found in medieval churches, but in this case, it appears in the maritime setting as well. Uh, in the midst of the hardships of sea, there was also some time for recreation. This is a board for a nine man's Morris game. Uh, it is carved on a natural bench as shown here by my colleagues so that one can sit and enjoy a game in comfort. But putting these unique carvings aside, the majority of the maritime graffiti has to do with identity. 80 to 90% of the carvings communicate, communicate individual identity and origin. And this implies that the purpose of the graffiti is to show your presence in these harbors and communicate it to others. Yeah, so right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the documentation process when it comes to uh, these. I call them carvings because I normally work with prehistoric rock art, <laughs> so I'm just going to continue to do that. Uh, these carvings, and as Ingla said, we've been working now for for some twelve years, and um, when we started out, uh, we used very traditional methods. We uh, traced the carvings using chalk, and then we painted them, took a flat photo with a measuring stick, and that was the documentation. Uh, but as time has moved on, of course, uh, different 3D techniques have been come, become more available, and we've added that to our toolbox, uh, because we still believe that uh, on-site interpretation, which was what we did to begin with, is very important. A 3D model is a very nice representation of a rock surface, uh, but at least in my mind, it's not a documentation of carving, uh, because you need the interpretation, and the interpretation needs to be done at the site, and that is at least my opinion. Uh, and the um, the documentation method that we've mainly used is structure from motion or, or photogrammetry. Uh, and we've done that uh, mostly due to economy reasons. It's the cheapest way of doing it. And uh, here you can see me walking around with a handheld camera taking many, many images of a panel and the result might look some, something like this uh, in the end. And the, um, the idea here with we're using SFM is, well, it's several different reasons. One is, of course, that you get this nice representation of the, of the rock surface, but uh, talking about somebody talked about using uh, SFM software before, uh, we use reality capture and we do that simply because it creates very nice textures. Um, so we get very high resolution images of larger panel areas, which is good. Uh, 3D models are also very nice for uh, analyzing rock carvings, but they print very poorly in reports. Uh, so that is one of the other reasons why we've chosen this method. Uh, so we use handheld cameras to create these high resolution uh, 3D models, but we also use uh, drone photography uh, to create lower resolution 3D models with the idea of not documenting the carvings, but rather documenting the site. 
Uh, and uh, we do this for, for two reasons. One is because it's very convenient for us uh, to be able to look at the relations between the different carvings, because we have some 1200 carvings on Hon Holman, and we want to know where is that specific carving, because we have it in our database, and then we know what did it actually look like, and what is it next to, and so on. Uh, so that is one part of it. But the other thing is that, uh, of course, this is an island, and people have a very hard time getting there. Uh, so this is also a public outreach uh, initiative. So we've put our <laughs> Our 3D models on Sketchfab, so people can actually visit uh, Hon uh, digitally, at least. Um, and um, we've also uh, tried laser scanning uh, with a red laser, and um, it actually works quite well. Uh, this is a uh, laser scan of the uh, well, the the. The, the panel with all the heraldic shields that Linnea talked about before, uh, in this case, digitally enhanced with uh, oblique lighting. Uh, there are other methods that we use as well to digitally enhance the, the 3D models. Uh, I don't have time to, to go into to the, the process now, but uh, we use this different methods in our interpretations. And if we then move on to the documentation process again, uh, what we do now is then we, we have the, the 3D models that we've generated, and then we uh, take our enhanced version out in the field printed, uh, so we can do the on-site interpretation in the end. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the rock with the, the carvings on it right now is very nice and clean, and that is because we've cleaned it with ethanol, because the issue, of course, when you're working outside is that, especially in Boisland, is that everything is covered with lichen. Uh, and the, coming from the rock carving world, the, uh, the recommended method from the Swedish National Heritage Board is using ethanol. So that is what we're doing right now because it's supposedly uh, not damaging the, the granite. Uh, and then we permanently paint the carvings. And I know that this is, an, in a, especially in a non-Scandinavian context, is very controversial. Uh, but we, we've chosen to do this for, for two reasons. Uh, one is obvious, and that is public outreach. Uh, it is making these otherwise completely invisible because carvings in granite, uh, because the granite is so coarse, are very, very hard to see. Uh, so if you want people to see them, you have to paint them. Uh, and the other is protection, uh, because as Ingela said, uh, this is a very busy harbor. And uh, it gets a lot of visits from sailing boats. Uh, some of them use permanent anchorages, as the one you see uh, up there, uh, the, the metal loop. But most of them use temporary solutions, steel bridges that you hammer into uh, fissures in the rock. And since the rock is covered with carvings, um, that's not a good idea. Uh, so painting the carvings hopefully makes people not add uh, these anchorages right into the carvings. But here you can see, uh, since the, the carving wasn't painted when somebody added this permanent anchorage, it's been added right into a carving. And the other issue uh, when it comes to the protection of the carvings is that, well, with all these sailing boats, uh, all these tourists, there's quite a lot of barbecuing going on. And the, the idea is also to simply protect them from fire damage, which would otherwise be a big problem. Uh, and um, also, in, in, in talking about the protection of the carvings, uh, one good way of doing this is making people aware of their existence. So right now we're in the process of adding these signs to the islands as well. Uh, but again, back to the documentation process, uh, because we end up almost where we started uh, with our documentation. And in that, we uh, today we take flat photos of the carvings with a measuring stick. Uh, but we also uh, measure every single carving with a high resolution GPS to be able to, to create a database uh, where we can then link uh, all the information we've gathered about these carvings, the categories and so on, um, and then plot them. And this is the harbor uh, as seen from above. And uh, you saw the distribution of the carvings before when Ingela showed you, but this is another way of just distributing them. And unfortunately, the categories now are, of course, in Swedish, because well, Swedish, no. Uh, but you can see that here we can plot 
we could plot them by type, we can plot them by date and so on. So this is a very nice way and really helps us uh, when we're trying to interpret and describe the site. And I believe that was the second to last slide. This is the last one. And uh, thank you very much for letting us come here. And um, hopefully um, you have notes and questions. Um, and feel free to contact us at any point. And thank you very much for listening.